Well, things are not always what they seem, are they? Especially in a COVID season. Things are not always what they seem for the children of Israel, who in in Joshua chapter 22, we're going to see one of the great misunderstandings of the book of Joshua, probably the great misunderstanding that almost ends in an incredible tragedy. But things are also not as they seem oftentimes for us. I, I feel like sometimes my life is one big misunderstanding. I, sometimes I fail to communicate. Sometimes I, I, I just don't handle things well. In college, I had the privilege of spending a couple summers in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. as a part of a campus ministry, and they would take uh, our, the students down to the beach for the summer. Um, they work, we work kind of these, these tourist jobs during the day, study the Bible and minister at night. And, and it was an incredibly formative time for me. It was also incredibly fun. And so one of our fun times, I was spending, out by the, sending out, spending time out by the pool. We stayed at the place called the Sandman Hotel. It sounds really nice, doesn't it? And so at the Sandman, we were out by the pool. There's a group of us college students and, and, doing, and, and us young men were doing what young men do, trying to impress the young women. And so my friend Todd, he, he kind of stands up and he says, hey, watch this. And he does this funny dive into the pool. And as he's saying that, you know, in my one upmanship, I said, well, hey, watch this. So he's diving in. I'm like, no, you guys watch this. And I dive in the pool right after him. And I grab a hold of him under the water. And I take him to the bottom of the pool. And he kind of starts fighting with me and, and battling a little bit. And so I kind of battle him back. And you know, when you have a good friend, you might do things to them you wouldn't do to somebody else. And so I kind of kick him a little bit and, and try to pull his swim trunks down. And we're wrestling under the water. This crowd's gathering around the pool. And, and the intensity grows. Like it's, it's almost becoming a fight as much as you can underwater. And so I'm, you know, he hits me and I hit him back. We're, we're going, we're going, we're going. And finally, I'm running out of air. And so I've, I've got to let go. And, and so we, we come to the surface. And as we come to the surface, I hear Todd laughing, but it's not right next to me. He's on the other side of the pool and he's saying, Barclay, it's not me. (laughs) You see, I had grabbed some complete stranger (laughs) who was on vacation and was just swimming laps in the pool and I'd taken him to the bottom of the pool and we had wrestled. And so as everyone's laughing and I'm kind of trying to laugh and apologize at the same time, um, fortunately, we weren't close enough where this guy could hit me. I just said, I'm oh, sorry, you know, I was trying to pull his pants down and, and, uh, and I just kind of, you know, cowered and left the pool area and stayed out of there for the rest of the weekend. And, but things are not always as you seem and, and especially in a COVID season. Have you tried to talk to somebody through a mask and you just can't get there sometimes? You know, you're trying to make expressions with your eyes, like trying to smile with your eyes is really hard, isn't it? So we're in a time where there's a lot of misunderstanding and misinformation. Hey, we're in the book of Joshua, three weeks till Easter. Can you believe it? Three weeks till Easter. It's hard to believe. We're, uh, this is the second to last week till we're, um, till we're uh, finishing up our, our study in the book of Joshua. And so we've, we've seen Joshua, and, and, and in the beginning, he entered the land, didn't he? He led God's people into the promised land. What an incredible time. Across the Jordan River into the promised land. And then we saw them conquer the land. We, we actually looked at two battles. Which, it was an incredibly intense time of, of just conquering the land and battling some really hard things we, we dealt with and saw them deal with. And then now we're in the, the, the third section that's possessing the land. And this week and next week, Hunter will finish things up. And we're talking about possessing the land. If you've been, if you've been reading through the book of Joshua, you've seen some of the chapters that got a little boring in this last section, haven't they? Because it's talking about this allotment of the land. And for God's people, at that time, this wouldn't have been boring stuff because if you're receiving the land, it would have been really important and powerful stuff. For us, it's a little bit harder to engage. But this morning, we're gonna see one of the possibly the great misunderstandings in the book of Joshua. Here's the big point. The greatest determiners of holiness and unity for God's people are proper worship of God and healthy community with each other. Some of the greatest determiners of of holiness and unity are how how a people properly worship God and how they communicate with each other. Does it sound familiar? Love God, love people. 
Let's look at Joshua chapter 22, verse 1. Then Joshua summoned the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and said to them, You have done all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and you have obeyed me in everything I commanded. For a long time now, to this very day, you have not deserted your fellow Israelites, but have carried out the mission the Lord God gave you. All right, so you may be wondering, who are these Gadites and these Reubenites? This is really weird, isn't it? Well, it, Jacob had 12 sons, and there's 12 tribes of Israel, it, it, 12 or 13, as you, depending on how you count. And, and, and so these, these Gadites are literally the descendants of Gad, who was a son of Jacob. The Reubenites, same thing. Reuben's a son of Jacob. They're the Reubenites. It'd be just like my descendants would be, could be called the Johnites. Or the Mickeyites or the Samites. And so it's just, it's just the, the name of their clan or their tribe. And so there are 12 sons of Jacob. There are 12 tribes in Israel. And then on the map you see is the, it's the tribal allotments. And so you see the different names up there. It gets a little confusing because the son Levi or the tribe of Levi doesn't get a land allotment. They're actually the priestly tribe. And so they're, they're scattered through cities. So there's these holy cities that the priests live in. They have some land around the city, but they don't get a tribe. They're, they're, they're ministering to the people of the promised land. So you say, well, that should be 11 tribal allotments, right? No, because Joseph got a double portion or a double allotment. But you don't see Joseph's name up there because his allotment is divided and named by his sons, Ephraim, and Manasseh, and we'll see a little bit more about Manasseh later. So that's the allotment. There's, there's nine and a half tribes on this side, the west side of the river. There's two and a half tribes on the east side of the river, and we'll, we'll talk about more of that in just a moment. In verse two, it says this, you have done all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded, and you have obeyed everything I commanded. So what Joshua is saying is, you've done everything Moses has asked you. You've done everything I have asked you. And then look at this. For a long time now to this very day, you have not deserted your fellow Israelites, but have carried out the mission the Lord God gave you. This is a great resume. Now, what he's talking about here is these are the two and a half tribes, or three tribes, but it's really just two and a half tribes that are on the eastern side of the river. And they are um, going to help the <clears throat> excuse me, Western tribes um, conquer the promised land. <clears throat> they actually requested with Moses, hey, can we stay on the eastern side of the river? Can we stay over here and we'll help you conquer the promised land? That, that was Moses' one requirement. And so uh, um, Joshua was saying, hey, you've done it all. You've done everything we ask you to do. Well done. And, and what we learn from this is obedience, it proves your position. It proves it. It doesn't provide it, but it proves it. We'll talk about more about that in just a minute. Look at verse four. Now that the Lord your God <clears throat> has given them rest, as he promised, return <clears throat> to your homes in the land that the Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. All right, so I think I've got a, a zoomed in map for you here. And, and what's going on here is you've got the nine and a half tribes on the west and you've got two and a half on the east. And, then, and so you've got, uh, I see um, uh, Manasseh, you've got Gad, you've got Reuben. Manasseh's both on both sides of the river, half the tribe on one side, half the tribe on the other. And, and what Moses or what Joshua's saying is, you've done everything we've asked. You've, you've come across the, into the Western, the promise, the actual promised land. You've helped us conquer it. You've done what you're supposed to do. And now you can go home because God has given your, your brothers on the western side rest just like he's given you on the eastern side. Now, the western side is the actual uh, promised land, but Moses allowed them to settle east because they asked for it. They said that when, when they were camped over there, before they went over, they said, hey, could we just stay here? And that kind of gave everybody more land, and, and Moses allowed it. But there'll be some complications with it. So look at verse five. He gives them this charge. But be very careful to keep the commandment, the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you. So he gives them a warning. Hey, hey, be careful. We're, we're going to be somewhat divided. This, this Jordan Rift Valley is this giant valley. 
And the Jordan River, as we, as we talked about, it swells sometimes. So sometimes you're not going to be able to come to the, the west side of the Jordan and worship. The, the, the valley, it's really hot at certain times of the year. It's going to be really hard to cross. And he, so he says, hey, be very careful to keep the commandments that the uh, Lord your God gave you. And then he gives them five commands. Now, what's interesting is, that, is two of those commands are kind of overarching. And then he gives three practical ones. And so we're going to work our way through it. He gives five commands, to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commands, to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. And then Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their homes. But let's, let's work our way through them. First one there, to love and obey God. To, to love the Lord your God and to walk in obedience to him. And so it's kind of the, it's actually the first two. And so he says, hey, love God and obey God. That's, that, that's the overarching thing. Love God and obey him. It, it sounds very Deuteronomy 6-ish. Love God and obey him. And then he gives three practical ways for how they can do that. First, he says, keep his commands. Sounds kind of obvious, doesn't it? Keep his commands. Well, you think, okay, what are his commands? Well, for these people, for Joshua's people, God's people, they would be the, the book of Deuteronomy or most of the book of Deuteronomy. He's saying, keep these commands that the Lord your God gave you. And that's where this idea of your obedience, it proves your position. And sometimes in our culture today, we get a little confused and we think, okay, obedience, it provides the position with God, but it doesn't. Your obedience, it proves your position. It, it, it's the thing that, that, that people see in your life and you say, oh, that must be a Christ follower because of the way they live their life. It doesn't provide your position. No, you are saved. If you're a believer in Christ, you are saved by faith through grace. It's all Jesus. And it was faith in the Old Testament. It's faith in the New Testament times. Faith in a Messiah. So, but your obedience, it proves that you're part of the family of God. John 14, 21, Jesus says in these words kind of the same thing. He says this, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. So he's saying here, it's really interesting, whoever has my commands and obeys them or keeps them. Think about this idea of having God's commands, that you, you literally possess them. You, you know them. They're right here, and you know them so well, you can say them to yourself. Maybe you've memorized the scripture, and it begins to penetrate right here. It changes things when you possess the Lord's commands. There's a difference between obedience and conformity. Obedience is, is, is actively doing what you're supposed to do. Conformity is you do it on the outside, but you don't really believe it here. It's like an unrepentant child, you know? You know, when you're trying to get your kid to obey and you're like, come on, you know, and they're, they're, they're obeying on the outside, but you know it's not hitting right here. There's a difference between obedience and conformity. Hey, second thing there, he says, hold fast to him. This is the most interesting one, I think, because in our modern culture, in our, we don't talk like that, do we? We don't say, hey, great to see you. Hey, hold fast to the Lord this week. We don't say that, do we? But it's this incredibly powerful term. It literally means to adhere or be glued to or cleave to. You might remember a couple months ago, we had our marriage talk up here, and I used this glue illustration. You remember that? This word is the Hebrew word debak, which is the same Hebrew word that was used in, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 24, by the writer of Genesis, when it says, husband should hold fast to his wife to adhere. It's like that glue illustration where you had the hardener and that other part of the glue, and you, you mixed them together, and you glued them together. And it, it's, a, it's an adhering that never comes apart. It's so important. Just like in the marriage, to have and to hold from this day forward, in sickness and in health, for better, for worse. Yet it's different because it's not death to, you, to, de to tell death to you part. It's forever. When you're a child of God, you're literally adhered to him forever. You're part of his family. It's a bond that's never coming apart. It reminds me of my 
illustration, a consumer relationship versus a covenant relationship. You remember that a couple months ago? I told you I love to shop at Lowe's and I like the discount. I I like to keep track of my purchases. I love the color blue. But what happens when Home Depot has a better price? Bye bye Lowe's. That's a consumer relationship that, that man, it's, it's all about my needs. And as long as you meet my needs and I'm here, but when you stop meeting my needs, I'm going over here. And honestly, that's, I think, how a lot of Christians treat their relationship with God. It's, it's a consumer relationship. The Lord, man, things aren't going well right now or, or things are going too well. Bye-bye. And that's not how we should treat our relationship with the Lord. It should be a covenant relationship, like marriage. It, it should be adhered to and a bond that's never coming apart. In a consumer relationship, you might... Uh, is based on emotion. A covenant relationship is based on the other person's needs. Consumer relationships are saying, I, I, it's about my needs. A covenant relationship says it's about your needs and your focus. And what the culture doesn't understand is consumer relationships don't drive deep intimacy. Covenant relationships do. Because when you're there no matter what, and I'll tell you this, your God is there for you no matter what. Even if things are happening that you don't understand, even if it doesn't make sense, he's there for you and he loves you. He says, hold fast to him. And the third thing there, he says, serve him. Sounds basic enough, doesn't it? This idea of service, I think, is equal to suffering. Be willing to suffer for him. And we, when we think of suffering, we think of what happens over there, don't we? where maybe your life's in danger or you put yourself at risk or the, the missionary you're supporting, and that is suffering. It's definitely suffering, but, but we are called to suffer right here, and you can suffer every day for the Lord in just basic ways. Anytime you put aside your own wants and needs for the service of another and, and to glorify God, that's suffering. Maybe you give and you don't get to buy something. Maybe you, maybe you spend time serving. That's suffering. And service is suffering. And suffering in the body of Christ as we do it is really good. It's good for us. Let's pick up the story in uh, verse 9. So the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh left the Israelites at Shiloh in Canaan to return to Gilead, their own land, which they had acquired in accordance with the command of the Lord through Moses. When they came to Gilead... Near the Jordan, in the land of Canaan, the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an imposing altar there by the Jordan. So what's happening is the three, it's time for the, the two and a half tribes to go home. They've done what they're supposed to do. The, the, the battle's over. The land's divided. They, they've spent probably upwards of seven years helping conquer this promised land. They've been away from their families, and it's time for them to go home. And so that as they begin to walk home, you can almost imagine that they're leaving Shiloh, the place of worship, the, the political center of the nation of Israel, and they're walking home. They're probably walking through that super hot valley of Jordan, and the Jordan Rift Valley, and, and they're walking home. They're probably celebrating and telling stories and talking about the, the days to come. I can't wait till I can farm my land and, and raise my kids. And they're talking about being over there. And as they get closer and closer to the Jordan River, they're looking back at Shiloh, they're looking back, they're looking back, and you can almost imagine them coming out of this mountain range right here into that valley. And they're kind of going, man, it's a long ways over here to where we worship. What if they forget about us? What if, what if they don't remember, or their children, or their children's children, they don't remember that we're all the people of God? And so they build this altar And it seems like a good idea, and I think it was good intentions at the time, but it probably wasn't great execution of their idea. It was an altar built for worship and not for remembrance. I'm sorry, not for worship, but for remembrance. So here's how the Western tribes take it. Look at verse 11. And when the Israelites heard that they had built the altar on the border of Canaan in Gilead near the Jordan on the Israelite side, the whole assembly of Israel gathered at Shiloh to go to war. This is not good. When the nine and a half tribes heard what the eastern tribes had done, they were furious. They remembered that that commandment in Deuteronomy chapter 12. You have one God, one place of worship, one altar. What are they doing building an altar over here? But they didn't mean it to take the place of the other altar. 
but it was, it was taken out of context. You see, something that had been meant for unity had come across as apostasy. From, from the Eastern uh, tribe's point of view, they're like, hey, we're gonna build this to remind them of that we're all together. But from the Western tribe's point of view, they're saying, I can't believe they would depart from the Lord that quickly. Not only that, they're building the altar on our side of the land, not on their side. And so the Western tribes, what they do is they send a delegation and they send this guy named Phineas. Now, if you listen to the Bible app and the NIV, that guy with the British accent, have you listened to that? The guy with the British accent, he, talk, he, says, he calls him Phinehas. But we're not gonna call him that. We're gonna call him Phineas because we live in Arkansas. So Phineas, um, he, he, they nominate Phineas and 10 tribal leaders to go and talk to the Eastern tribes. Now, you gotta understand they're sending a message by sending Phineas. And I'm trying to think about a picture. How would you picture Phineas? What, who would he be like? Yeah. What if this guy showed up on your doorstep? What if Clint Eastwood shows up on your doorstep? You know in the good and the bad and the ugly, if he shows up, it's not good. It's gonna be bad or it's gonna be ugly. And that's how Phineas is regarded. He's a priest, but he's the guy that does the dirty work. He's the guy in Numbers, I think it's chapter 25, that, that when the Israelite men were doing things with the Moabite women they weren't supposed to do, and Phineas showed up, he literally put a spear through a man and a woman at the same time. They're sending a message to the Eastern tribes. They're saying, this is not good. Let's look what Phineas has to say. The whole assembly of the Lord says, how could you break faith with the God of Israel like this? Now that word break faith there is a very strong word. It's a very accusatory word. We're actually gonna see it used in a few verses later when they talk about Achan's sin. He's basically likening what, what they're doing here with what Achan did. He said this trespass, this, this how could you break faith? I think later he calls it unfaithfulness. How could you break faith with the God of Israel like this? How could you turn away from the Lord and build yourselves an altar in rebellion against him now? Was not the sin of Peor enough for us? Up to this very day, we have not cleansed ourselves from that sin, even though a plague fell on the whole community of the Lord. And you are now turning away from the Lord? If you rebel against the Lord today, tomorrow he will be angry with the whole community of Israel. The symbol meant for unity has become a symbol that is interpreted as apostasy. Have you ever been misunderstood or even misunderstood like that or maybe in a smaller? It doesn't feel very good, does it? <clears throat> Here they are and they've sent Phineas. You know, he's standing on the doorstep. They've sent him to, to communicate a message. And here they're trying to figure out how they respond. Have you ever been misunderstood like that? And somebody's come at you, accused you of something maybe you didn't do. We, uh, our family was one time out. We were out for dinner one night. We're sitting at this round table at a local restaurant. <clears throat> and we're kind of having a fun time. We're being a lot more gregarious or loud than we normally are. And we actually, at the time, we had a, a foreign exchange student live with us named Maria. And Maria was this sweet little Young lady, she was like 16 or 17. She was a senior in high school and she's lived with us for a year. And so we were doing this thing. My kids had an app where you could kind of, you know, you take a picture of each other or you know, it augments your face. And it was really funny. And we were doing it to each other and we were laughing. Then we did it to Maria and it was really funny. And so we kept laughing and, and we we're all laughing at each other. And this family right next to us says, we know what you're doing. And I don't process real fast sometimes. And so if you ever have a misunderstanding with me, give me grace. And so I'm like, okay, you know, maybe they don't like us making fun of Maria, I don't know. And so I just kind of keep going on, but we, we're a little quieter and, and we're kind of processing with it. No, and they said, no, we know what you're doing. You're, you're taking pictures of us and you're making fun of our family. And you know, it still was hard, hard to register and then we kind of got real quiet and they left and it was the most awkward moment. I felt so bad that they had thought that we were making fun of them. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're making fun of our foreign exchange student. It's really okay. <laughs> no. But I felt terrible. And then I kind of got angry. I, I, being misunderstood, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good for the party 
that, that assume that, it doesn't feel good for you. Matter of fact, there's probably a 10% chance that fam- family goes to fellowship. So if you're, out there, if you're watching online, if you're in the room, I'm sorry. I'm sorry we had that misunderstanding, but it doesn't feel good. You see, assumption is probably the worst level of communication, the lowest level. Anytime we assume, if, if you are somebody who lives your life and you, kinda, you assume a lot of things and it hurts your feelings, always assume the highest thing possible. If you're gonna live that way, just go high because it helps out. It sure would have helped out in that situation, would have helped out in what's going on with the Israelites. Look at verse 19, he continues. This is Phineas. If the land you possess is defiled, come over to the Lord's land where the Lord's tabernacle stands and share the land with us. But do not rebel against the Lord or against us by building an altar for yourselves other than the altar of the Lord our God. When Achan, the son of Zerah, was unfaithful, there's that word. When Achan trespassed, when Achan sinned in regard to the devoted things, did not wrath come upon the whole community of Israel? He was not the only one who died for his sin. You see, he's so passionate about that. He's saying, hey, if it's so bad living over here, come over, we'll make room for you. That's a pretty big offer. Come to the west side of the Jordan but you guys can't have another altar. This is not okay. Now, I want you to understand that their response here is everything. How they respond to this situation, the tension is incredible, and how they respond right now determines if the nation of Israel goes to war with itself. And imagine who's standing there It's a point of tension, isn't it? He's ready to draw his guns. Listen to their response. The mighty one, God, the Lord. The mighty one, God, the Lord. Now, we may not fully understand it, but what he's saying here, he's saying the most powerful thing possible. That this is big. This is huge. He's going, the, he's, it says El, in Hebrew, El, Elohim, Yahweh. He's ascribing to the highest authority possible. He's saying, God knows. Don't come at us. God knows our heart. God knows our intention. The mighty one, God, the Lord, the mighty one, God, the Lord, he knows. And let all Israel know, if this has been in rebellion or disobedience to the Lord, do not spare us this day. If we have built our own altar to turn away from the Lord, And to offer burnt offerings and grain offerings or to sacrifice fellowship offerings on it, may the Lord himself call us into account. And they continue on. That is why we said, let us get ready and build an altar, but not for burnt offerings or sacrifices. On the contrary, it is to be a witness between us and you and the generations that follow that we worship the Lord in his, at his sanctuary with our burnt offerings, our sacrifices, our fellowship offerings. Then in the future, your descendants will not be able to say to ours, you have no share with us. So the response is really humble. It's like we didn't build another altar for sacrifice. We built it as a witness, a reminder. We're, we're gonna worship over there. We believe the same thing you do. Their response is very humble. But it makes me wonder and ask you the question, do you think it would have helped? Do you think there's something they could have done to prevent this misunderstanding? What if while they were building this this altar, they said, hey, I wonder what the Western tribes are gonna think of this. I wonder if they're gonna get mad about it. Hey, Bob, why don't you run back He's head of the Bobites. Bob's gonna run back and he's gonna check with them and see if they're okay with us building an altar apart from Shiloh on their land. Do you think that'd have been wise? I do. I think that'd have been real wise. You see, what they needed was a holy land communication plan. That's what they needed. Now you might look up here and see and some of these things come from this marriage talk a couple months ago because it's, it's, it's exactly the same thing they needed. Hey, when you're in a situation Communicate early and often. What if they just sent the the guy back and said, hey, check on this, is this okay? No, it's not okay. Matter of fact, if you do it, we're gonna go to war. Okay, maybe we need to do something a little different. Communicate early, communicate often. Second thing, believe the best. What if the Western tribes, if they were over here and they're like, hey, 
They built this imposing altar on our land. It doesn't feel very good, but you know, those are our brothers. Hey, let's send somebody over to check on it, but not Phineas. You know, let's don't send that message. Let's just let's check on it. Believe the best. If you're gonna live a life assuming, just assume the best. Go, go high on it. Third thing, pray about it. Enough said, but when you pray about it, it really, really prepares your heart. Fourth thing, practice the circle principle. We've talked about that a lot, especially in re-engage, that you draw a circle around yourself and you focus on everyone in the circle. You can only control this one. And I'm not saying you can control me, I'm saying you can control yourself. You can only control the person in your circle and, and really focus on that. And what if the Western tribes that have said, hey, we're gonna draw a circle on ourselves, we're gonna focus on ourselves, we'll check on that, but we're gonna focus on ourselves. Same thing with those guys. What if they'd have done that? And then I'd almost add a fifth one to this. When Sam comes and speaks at our marriage re-engage uh, event or, or ministry, he does something, he says, he says um, it, focus on the top 20% of things going wrong in any relationship, the bottom 80%, if this is not a top 20% or maybe it uses 10%, but whatever the top things, focus on that. If it's a bottom 80% thing, just push it away. If it's important enough, it'll work its way up. And when you do that, it's amazing how much conflict goes away and you focus on the important things. Now, for the Western tribes, this was a top 20% thing and they needed to address, address it, but they should have addressed it earlier in a different kind of way. Look at the response. Then Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the priest, and the leaders returned to Canaan from their meeting with the Reubenites and the Gadites in Gilead and reported to the Israelites. They were glad to hear the report and praised God. And they talked no more about going to war against them to devastate the country where the Reubenites and the Gadites lived. And the Reubenites and the Gadites gave the altar this name, a witness between us that the Lord is God. They said, this is not an altar for sacrifice. This is an altar to remember. Do we have something for us that we're supposed to remember? Something we do? Yeah. We've all experienced misunderstanding. We've all experienced this, 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 this COVID season and it's been challenging. But through good communication and active listening and misunderstanding can be dealt with well. You see, the altar they built, they built for a witness. And we can come to the table and, and have a witness and remember. And that's what we're going to do this morning to close out the service is we're going to come to the table and we're going to remember. Jesus' body was broken for us. Jesus' blood was shed for us. And that should serve as a reminder that we are who we are. Or let me put it this way, whose we are. So let's worship the, God, the Lord together. Will you pray with me? Lord, we come before you and just say thank you. Thank you for this reminder that we who believe in Christ are yours. May we always remember that in the covenant relationship. And may coming to the table remind us, serve as a witness to us that, that together we are God's people, both in this church and, and global, the global church. And Lord, we ask that you would guide us and you would protect us. We ask you would help us to live and be the church. But as we come to the table now, we ask that you would help us remember.